Presented by Caltech. So we're using an example of the lossless transmission line uh, to discuss uh, putting a standing wave in between uh, two boundary conditions, the boundary conditions here being the, the voltage is equal to zero at the two ends. And so we derived our normal modes for the voltage as a function of position and time in the form that I wrote up there. And we ended up starting to talk again about superposition and noticing in particular that the wave equation is a linear equation, and so any linear combinations of a solution is also a solution. That is, we have d squared b and t squared minus b squared d squared b by d x squared equals zero. That's the wave equation, so it's a linear equation. <coughs> so we can take arbitrary solutions and make new solutions by making linear combinations of them. And in particular, we can superpose normal modes. So then we're going to have a superposition general supervision, superposition that would look like, uh, so we just take linear combinations of those functions up there, and we can take n equals 1 to infinity, p sub n sine by x over l sine sine omega sub n t, where omega sub n is, is that quantity there. So clearly we can get some rather arbitrary looking uh, voltage, voltages along the transmission line if we do this. Every term, of course, satisfies the boundary condition with the voltage is zero at the end. So our arbitrary function that we get when we do the superposition also satisfies the boundary conditions, as it should. Uh, but doing this, adding these signs up leads us to a, a very powerful technique. And this is the technique of Fourier analysis. We can take an arbitrary function or arbitrary voltage shape and break it up into <coughs> terms with well-defined frequencies. So we can Fourier analysis a function of position and time into functions that are function are sines and cosines in general, and in this case sines. <coughs> so let's uh, let's do this in kind of general. Suppose we have. Some function where this function is defined on the interval from zero to L, x to L, with the boundary conditions that um, f of zero equals f of L is equal to zero. So the same boundary conditions as we've just been using. So, <coughs> without going through the possibly uh, mathematical details of, of seeing whether this is rigorous or not, we may write a 
there may be some technical conditions, but in general, we may write that this function f of x, our arbitrary function f that satisfies the boundary conditions, as a sum from n equals 1 to infinity of terms of the form sine n pi x over f. Clearly, it satisfies the boundary conditions, so that's good. And we just need to show that any function we care to choose, we can expand in that way. And then, of course, the a sub n are the expansion coefficients. So let me show that, in fact, we can do this, and at the same time, show what these expansion coefficients are in terms of the function f. Okay. So we use what we call orthogonality relations. That's of the form the integral from 0 to L, our domain uh, for x, sine n pi x over L times sine m pi x over L. So this is just like taking a scalar product of, of two functions in a function space. So, okay, so we're dealing with a vector space that happens to have an infinite number of directions. Uh, and our basis functions, uh, our basis vectors are these functions. And what we're doing is defining a kind of a scalar product. And the scalar product is such that it's equal to zero unless n is equal to m, in which case it's L over two. So this is the Kronecker delta. It's zero if m is not equal to n and is equal to one if m is equal to n. So let's verify this. So I claim that. Is it true? Okay, so we need to check it. So let's, uh, let's suppose n is equal to m. So then we have an integral from 0 to l of sine n pi x over l squared dx. And the claim is that should be equal to l over 2. So OK, so we can let this be y. And this there is l over 2 pi dy, so not to pi n pi, n pi dy. <coughs> and so we get uh, the L over n pi out front. <coughs> the integral now goes from 0 to n pi. And we get sine squared y dy. Okay, but so we're integrating a sine squared over an integral number of half wavelengths, and it doesn't matter if it's sine squared or cosine squared, you get the same answer. So I take and replace this by one half sine squared plus cosine squared. And so then I get that the integral of the n pi over 2, so L over n pi times n pi over 2, since it's the integral of 1, um, or 1 half. And so this is just equal to L over 2 is claimed. Okay, now let's try N is not equal to M. So then I have an integral from 0 to L and of sine N pi X over L sine sine m pi x over l x. Again, I let y equal, say, pi over l times x. And so I can rewrite this as 
is L over pi integral from 0 to pi. Sine my sine my dy. Now I use a trig identity. Well, the sum and difference of, of angle kind of trig identity to, to write this as L over pi integral from zero to pi of one half, so the cosine of n minus m times y minus the cosine of n plus m times y dy. And so if you work this out, cosine of n plus m times y is cosine n, cosine m, y. The same thing here, so the cosine terms cancel and you just have left the sine terms. Uh, and then you divide by half and you that because that product of sines. So this I can integrate. It's just integrating the cosine, which is the sine. So L over 2 pi, take the sine, the, the half out front, and, and now do the integral. So once I've done the integral, I get sine n minus m, y over n minus m, minus sine n plus m over m plus m. And this is to be evaluated at 0 and pi, uh, but sine uh, n is not equal to m, uh, but so it's, it's going to be evaluated at sine 0 and sine some integer times pi, it's always zero. So this is equal to zero. And so that's, what's, that's what we claimed it should be. So, so this is zero and n is not equal to n. So we've demonstrated that our orthogonality relation holds, and now we can use it to determine the a sub n coefficients for any given function f of x. sides by sine m pi x over L and do the integral on both sides from 0 to L. So we get 0 to L of sine m pi over L x times, we put the, let's put the coefficients on this side, n equals 1 to infinity base of n sine m pi over L x dx. So that's one side of the equation. And the other side is just integral from 0 to L sine m pi over L x f of x dx. So what we got? So I just take this and done that. I've switched the two sides. So on the part on the left, because of our orthogonality relations, only n equals m can change. And so 
And we know what the orthogonal wave relation is, so we get L over 2 for that n equals m term times a sub m is then equal to 0 to L times m pi over L x f of x dx. Or if we want to write it down as an equation for the a sub m, this is just 2 over L integral from 0 to L sine m pi over L x f of x dx. So this is for m equals 1, 2, and so forth. We call this equation 2. <laughs> so these two equations together express what's known as the Fourier sine transformation. Series are called, and the series for F is called um, the Fourier sine series. Why were the sines special? Why not cosines? That's because of our boundary conditions. If the boundary conditions were different, uh, say df by dx at 0 equals df by dx at l equals 0. Then we would find that we'd use cosines, because the derivative of the cosine is a sine, and then the sine at the 0 and l would be 0. Then we would expand a cosine and pi over lx. And we would get the corresponding Fourier cosine series. <coughs> we would have a similar theorem to, to this one. So let me uh, consider a wave equation. So this notion we're going to use a lot, quite a bit now. Uh, in fact, Depending on the problem, it may not be sines or cosines that are the relevant basis functions, if you like. There may be other sequences of functions, and we'll encounter some. So let me consider waves in, in many dimensions. Or many means greater than one, spatial dimension. Uh, and consider in particular the Helmholtz equation, what we call the Helmholtz equation. So yeah, then we have to find out what the public pair is. Uh, so let's see. So let's let's just stay with one dimension for a little bit. So let's consider the wave equation. d squared by dx squared of the function of x and t minus 1 over v squared d squared by dt squared f of x and t equal to 0. And we consider solutions. of the form some coefficient times e to the i kx plus or minus omega t. We refer to these as plane waves. In one dimension, it's a little hard to see a plane. But if you go to, say, three dimensions, our ordinary uh, world, 
of three dimensions, then <coughs> such a wave has, uh, has say, its nodes. It propagates along with a wave front, and the wave front is, lies on a plane. Which are wave fronts following each other, say crests of a wave, they're following each other, they're just planes in three dimensions. So that's why it's called a plane wave. So in writing down that solution, we've effectively factorized our solution into a function of space and a function of time. And so this kind of separation of variables is going to become another theme in how we approach multi-area problems. So Explicitly, a e to the i k x times e to the plus or minus i omega t. Function of position times a function of time. <clears throat> and in particular, this separation, this factorization, works for normal modes. As you know, as you, if you look back, you see that. Uh, and we write, so we can write what we choose to, we write f of x and t is equal to some function, I'll call it u of x, times our time dependency. If I plug this into the wave equation, I just get that d squared by dx squared total derivatives now on u, u of x plus, um, so the e to the a omega t part is going to cancel out, so I'm not even going to write it down anymore. Well, when I operate with the time derivative on this, I bring down a minus i omega squared, so I get, um, I get plus omega squared over v squared times u of x is equal to zero. The plus or minus gets squared, so it doesn't, it doesn't factor in the i squared gives a minus to cancel the minus in the wave equation. Um, so I can rewrite this knowing that K is just omega over V, so I can just rewrite this as D squared by DX squared of U of X plus K squared U of X is equal to zero. So we have a wave equation uh, for the x dependence <coughs> now in the form of this. And it's not, not hard to generalize this to multiple dimensions. So we, if we fact, factorize out the time dependence, then we can then whatever we have left is, is a, uh, uh, just a differential equation in position. Of course, if it's in multiple dimensions, we use del squared, which is by dx1, sorry, squared plus d squared by dx2 squared, so all the many dimensions there are. Laplacian operator in n dimensions, if the x 
uh, if the x sub i are the Cartesian coordinates of the point in, in, in dimensional Euclidean space. And so then we get, we place the d squared by dx squared by del squared u of x plus k squared u of x equal to zero, where k squared is just the scalar product of k with itself, so k is the vector a1 up to k sub n. So an equation of this form has a name, it's known as the Helmholtz equation. Since it has to do with waves, it's very clearly an important equation. It's effectively an eigenvalue equation for the Laplacian operator, so Bill's period is Laplacian. So it's effectively an eigenvalue equation for the Laplacian operator plus whatever boundary conditions we have. So we don't have to, to completely specify the problem, you have to specify the boundary conditions. <coughs> They're important. <coughs> And we're living in some function space now. So in fact, our vector space that we're finding the eigenvalues in is an infinite dimensional vector space. Okay. But otherwise, you know, it's just like I got some linear operator, which in our finite dimensional spaces is a finite n by n matrix, but now it's some matrix in infinite number of dimensions operating on a, a vector, a function in this case, um, and k squared or minus k squared is the eigenvalue of that operator. So it's just like our matrix equations, except uh, we're generalizing to operations on functions. Let's do a little example. Let's consider A circular drum head. Most drum heads are circular, so well, it's kind of realistic. Um, and we want to calculate the normal models. So we have some circular drum head, radius A, say. We'll put the origin and Cartesian coordinates at the center. Just, you know, make use of whatever symmetry you've got. And we consider waves on this drum head. So you hit it and, and you know, the membrane vibrates around and makes noise. So we have on this drum head our wave equation, taking out the time, the, the time uh, dependence. So we, all, we always assume we have a, a wave with e to the i omega t dependence for a normal mode. Okay, so we're doing normal modes here. We assume that we have some uh, specific frequency that we're working with. Equals zero. So that's, so that's the Helmholtz equation for a drum head where del squared is just, uh, oh well, let me, let me finish the statement of the problem, with the boundary conditions that u at the boundary along, along the rim of the drum, we assume that things are tied down on the rim, so the displacement u, so u is just the displacement of the membrane as a function of position, and that displacement is equal to zero around the edges. We assume that we 
take the plane and the drone to the um, uh, to be the equilibrium position. So the height of the, height of the membrane is above the drone is zero. And K is as usual omega over V, where we pick some, we have some frequency omega. In general, be quantized, just like it was uh, for our transmission line. Okay, so we want to solve this equation for the normal modes. <coughs> we want to find the solutions to that equation with those boundary conditions. It has a nice circular symmetry. And if you have a problem with <coughs> symmetry, and, and it, do your darndest to use that symmetry because it's going to make your life easier. And so if it has that symmetry, that symmetry suggests using um, circular over coordinates. Is R and theta. <clears throat> so the Laplacian. Well, in Cartesian coordinates, it would be just dx squared plus dy squared. So I, if I put a coordinate system on this, a Cartesian coordinate system, I just could say put y that way and x that way. Well, I always label the root x as x equals y equals 0. That's what the Laplacian is in uh, polar coordinates. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm using to save writing, I'm, I'm using dx squared as the operator to say the different partial derivative with respect to x. Okay. In terms of polar coordinates, this is 1 over r. I'll write it all out here. <coughs> by dr plus 1 over r squared d squared by d theta squared. So before I go on, I'm not sure how uh, comfortable people are with expressing things that are lost in other coordinate systems. So let me actually derive this once and for all, and just make sure that we understand how to do these things. So, Let's see. So what do we have to do? So we have a Cartesian coordinate system, x and y. Del squared is just the gradient. Well, OK. By convention, we don't write the vector sign, but it's the gradient dotted into a set. Where del is in Cartesian coordinates, it's a unit vector. Let me, let me denote the unit vector in the x direction of the x hat um, d by dx plus a unit vector in the y direction d by dy. Okay. That's what the gradient operator is expressed in the Cartesian coordinates. So to take del dot del in polar coordinates, I want to know what the gradient is in polar coordinates. And now that I move my picture up, I have to draw it again. Okay. 
So I have some point, it has, it has coordinates x and y, uh, but I can express those as r and theta. I can describe the same point by r and theta. And so the gradient operator is going to be something times a unit vector in the r direction plus something times a unit vector in the theta direction. So a unit vector in the r direction looks like this, length one, and a unit vector in the theta direction looks like this. So r hat I can express as as a unit vector in the x direction times cos and theta plus a unit vector in the y direction times sine theta. <laughs> this unit vector in the theta direction, I can express as a unit vector in the x direction times a minus sine theta. So I do the same thing here. It's going to the minus direction in this picture, so I'll put the minus sign. Plus y hat times cos and theta. So I have a way to transform my unit vectors from one point of the system to the other. And so the Laplacian in, not the Laplacian, the gradient in my polar coordinates is going to be just, uh, I want to know how much my function changes per unit change in r, per change in length along the r direction. So along the r direction, I want to take the derivative with respect to r. Let's move in a length in a distance of r, dr. In the theta direction, I have to be a little careful here because when I take d theta, I want to know how much my function changes per unit length change in the theta direction. And the, and the length change is if I, if I do it over here, so this is theta, and then I take d theta, which is going to be small, then this distance that I traverse here at the end here is just r d theta. Of course, what I really want is the chord, which I'll call c. So I need to calculate the chord. What I'll do is I'll calculate c over 2. Because then I can draw a perpendicular here, and this is d theta over 2. And I know I've got a distance of, uh, well, let's see, what is it? It's going to be, uh, it's going to be r times sine d theta over 2. Uh, r times sine d theta over 2. I want to take the limit as theta become, d theta becomes infinitesimal. So I do a Taylor series expansion of the sine function. So I get that this is equal to r d theta over 2 plus of order d theta cubed, which I go to neglect. So I get c is equal to r d theta. So that's, my, that's the length that I'm going to go by. So, so in the theta direction, I have um, a d by d by r d theta. So I have a 1 over r d by d theta. Is that clear? Communication OK? All right, I'm almost there. I've got the gradient in polar coordinates. Now I've got to calculate the Laplacian. So del squared 
is just equal to del dot del. So that's going to be R e R plus theta hat 1 over R d theta partial dotted into R e R plus theta hat 1 over R d theta. So I need to do that now. I need that stuff up there. I really need it. Okay, so let me erase this. Move this down a little bit so that you can see it. I hope. And let me do the calculation. So here's where you have to start being careful. I don't know, we've been careful all over, okay? We're always careful. So the dot product. So we have an r hat p by dr. So that's this term, and I dot it with this term. Dot. So I'm just going to use linearity of my dot product. And write all the terms out. Being careful. Plus r hat d by dr, this times that, theta hat 1 over r d by d theta. Plus now let me work with this other term, theta hat 1 over r d by d theta, dotted into this term, r hat d by dr, plus the last term, which I'll write down here, uh, theta hat 1 over r d by d theta dot theta hat 1 over r d by d theta. So why did I do this at such length? Well, the problem is that r hat and theta hat are not independent of position. And so when I have derivatives, the derivatives are going to operate on my basis vectors too, because they're functions of position. Fortunately, they're only functions of theta. They're not functions of r. So the r derivatives are easy. So, uh, so here we got, um, so this r hat commutes with this derivative because there's no R dependence in R hat, and so this just becomes R hat dot R hat is one, and this just becomes p squared by dr squared for the first term. <clears throat> Likewise, the second term, there's no there's no R dependence in theta hat, so this derivative just goes, so we can just interchange the order, and we get an R hat dot theta hat, but that's zero. since they're orthogonal directions. Okay. okay, so we've done the first two terms. The third term, okay, let's write it out. Theta hat times one over r, d by d theta of r hat. <coughs> let's see, let's do a little cross side calculation. So if you get confused, when you're doing something like this, remember that this is an operator that operates on a function, and you can explicitly write that function in and, and see how you do it. So, so there's an f over here. And so I've got a derivative. This derivative, using the product rule, it operates on this times f, and it operates on f times this. Use the product rule. So let me consider the d by d theta operating on the r hat. Okay, that gives me x hat times minus sine theta plus y hat cosine theta, which is precisely theta hat. So that means this theta hat is going to dot into theta hat, not into r hat. 
it's not going to be zero. So it's going to be 1 over r times, let's see, where was I? I'm up here somewhere. Uh, 1 over r d by d theta r hat is just theta hat. d by d r. Plus the other term is, well, the other term is 0 because it's theta hat dot r hat. I'll write it down. 1 over r uh, dot r hat d by dr, but this is 0. This is 0. Okay, I got one more term to do. Uh, let's hope I'm going to get the right answer here. Uh, okay, so we have here theta hat. Theta hat, 1 over r. Okay, d by d theta of theta hat. To just be explicit, d by d theta of theta hat is just equal to x hat times uh, minus cosine theta um, minus y hat sine theta is equal to minus r hat. So this, so if I let the th d theta operate on theta hat, I'm going to get a minus r hat that I'm going to take the dot product with uh, times a d by d theta. But that's but that dot product equals zero. So that term goes away. So I got one thing left to consider. So I'm going to take out a 1 over r squared. Theta hat dot theta hat now is equal to 1. And I get d theta squared. 1 over r squared, it should be. d squared by d theta squared. Whew. OK, where am I? Now, as long as you do it very carefully, you can do it. And I invite you to do it with the spherical polar coordinates if you've never done it. Uh, and just derive what the Laplacian is. Stay for that. Or the gradient or whatever. Uh, but, you know, as long as you are careful and keep in mind that you, and these other these curvilinear coordinate systems, the basis vectors depend on position. So the derivatives operate on them too. We're just not used to it in Cartesian coordinates because they don't depend on position. Okay, so what do, I, what do I get? I get v by dr squared plus Theta dot, dot theta hat is 1, so I get a 1 over r d by dr for this term, plus the other thing I have is a 1 over r squared d theta squared. And now, where did I write down my claim for what it was equal to? Did I write that? I probably obscured it somewhere. Oh, I must have erased it. So this is the Laplacian in polar coordinates. Often you see it written as del squared is equal to 1 over r d by dr, r d by dr plus 1 over r squared, d by d theta squared. If you look at this term, you see that if you, if you do the derivative on that r there, you get precisely a second derivative plus this 1 over r times the first derivative. So these two are equal to each other. <clears throat> OK. So we know what the Laplacian is in our polar coordinates. We know we have a nice boundary condition in those coordinates. Uh, and so we use that. <coughs> so how do we do that? So we have our wave equation that, that looks like this. That's our wave equation that we're trying to solve. 
And we have del squared as this awkward looking operator. Uh, but just like we separated the time and the spatial coordinates, let's try to separate the angular dependence from the R dependence. And, and we'll be able to do that because we have a symmetry. So we try to find the solutions of the form. So this is, called, this is what we call separation of variables. It's a standard technique. So you know, probably you've seen it, but uh, if you haven't, that's what it's called. So we express our function u as a function of radius and angle, and we try to express it as the product of a function of r and a function of the angle. And then we see what we get for our derivatives. And, oh gosh, let's see. So our differential equation just gets kind of messy. Uh, one over r d by dr of r d by dr of r of r theta of <coughs> theta. So that's the r dependent term plus one over r squared d squared by d theta squared of r of r theta of theta plus k squared r of r theta of theta is equal to zero. So I'm rewriting the Helmholtz equation in polar coordinates with separation of variables. The idea is if we can find a solution to this, then by linearity we can uh, take arbitrary linear combinations of solutions of this form to make general solutions that may not be in the form of the separated. So it looks messy, there's a lot to write. But I did it step by step, and the step was pretty straightforward. How do I how do I use this equation? Well, I want to I want to use I want to separate out the R dependence and the theta dependence. So let's divide by the quantity R of R. Theta of theta and I want an r squared. So we're going to divide that equation by that. And that gives 1 over r, r, d by dr, which I'll write as the total derivative, because the only thing that's going to appear over here is a function of r, because the theta just goes all the way through and gets divided out. <coughs> Plus um, a one over let's say no, a one over theta for the theta part d squared by d theta of theta of theta. So again, the r this r just multiplies through and it got divided out. Uh, plus k squared r squared is equal to zero. Now I've got something I can use. This is independent of R. So if this is independent of R, then the rest of the equation must be independent of R too, in order to be able to get zero. And it depends on if it's different for different values of R, I'm not going to get zero when I add it to something that's independent of R. So this expression here must also be independent of R. So this implies that this is independent of R. It's just a constant. Likewise, this guy is independent of theta. 
And so that implies that this is independent of theta. So we just so I've got a, const, a constant plus a constant equal to zero. So the constant has to cancel each other to get zero. And so one over theta d squared by d theta squared of theta is equal to a constant, and one over r r d by R of R. Let's see how many R's do I have here? D by DR of, of R, D by DR of R plus K squared R squared is also equal to a constant. It's equal to minus the same constant. I have now differential equations, one dimensional differential equations. Got two, two one dimensional differential equations. I can work on each one separately. Is what I know about the difference, but yeah. Sorry, I think I missed it. What's the H? Oh, I'm writing a capital theta, which looks like it has a little H in it. Okay, cool. Thank yeah, you. sorry. No, it's not, I didn't get some fancy new symbol. Yeah, okay, sorry. sorry. Okay, so next time we're going to actually go ahead and solve this. We're going to solve these two equations. And then we'll find the normal modes on the, on the circular drum bed.